Hello to everyone. Good evening to those joining in the US and good morning to those joining from Japan. We're excited to share that we had that we have had about 175 people register from around the world. Of course, we wish everyone safety and health during this uncertain time. And in order, uh, sorry, in our current global situation, it is essential that we continue to communicate across borders and cultures. And our program is part of achieving this goal. My name is Paul Pass, and I am the Executive Director of the Japan America Society of Dallas Fort Worth. We are celebrating our 50th anniversary in 2020, and this event is the first of our summer programming season. Please note that this webinar is on the record and will be recorded. It will be uploaded to the JAS DFW website and YouTube channel likely as early as tomorrow. If you would like to ask a question during the program, please use the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. We encourage you to ask early since we may not be able to address all questions. If you wish to give in order to support the legacy of the Japan America Society and its promising future, we kindly ask that you consider a donation to help us continue our great work in the community. In a few moments, we will share a link in the chat box for our online giving portal. Now to begin our program is Grant Ogata, who serves as principal at Domi Tech Products and who also officially became the new board President of the Japan America Society of Dallas Fort Worth on Monday. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good morning to everyone. I'm, I'm Grant Ogata. Since uh, we're in the middle of a worldwide pandemic, we'd like to explore and learn about how US and Japanese IT and com communication companies are helping businesses to safely operate and allow people to interact while keeping the COVID-19 in check. We would also like to discuss some interesting differences between Japanese and U.S. businesses cultures in being able to adapt to new ways of conducting business using technology tools. In this webinar, we have four distinguished panelists from major companies providing IT and telecommunication service for the industry. We have two people based in the US working for Japanese companies and two people working in Japan for American companies in their Japanese branch. I will be asking around eight questions to the panelists, but we want to reserve some time at the end for you, the audience, to send in your questions that you might have using the Zoom chat box. You can send in your questions uh, anytime during our webinar. Before I introduce the panelists, I have to give you one standard disclaimer that opinions expressed in this webinar may or may not represent the official views of the companies they are employed by. This way, our panelists can freely express their opinions without getting into trouble with their companies uh, and hopefully make this into an interesting, fun, and informative session. Now let me introduce our panelists. First is Blair Bacher, VP of Business Continuity Management, Strategic Sourcing, Real Estate and Workplace Service at Hitachi Vantara. Hitachi Vantara is a subsidiary of the Japanese conglomerate Hitachi, which is one of the oldest and largest companies in Japan. Blair? Thank you, Grant. Um, and thank you, Paul, for uh, inviting me to the webinar. I appreciate you doing this. My name is Blair Bakra, as you uh, said, and I'm the Vice President of Strategic Sourcing, Business Continuity, and Real Estate. Uh, just quickly about Hitachi Vantara. So we're a digital infrastructure and solution subsidiary of Hitachi Limited. And Hitachi Limited is an $85 billion annual revenue J Japanese industrial conglomerate. A little bit about our customers. We serve 85 of the Fortune 800 companies, so 85 of the Fortune 100 companies, excuse me, and about 10,000 customers worldwide. We have been a leader in data storage hardware for more than 30 years, and that was Hitachi Data Systems that you may have heard of before, which was founded in 1989. Five years ago, we expanded into data management through the acquisition of Pentaho. And so think analytics, we also now have our own software business under the Lumada brand. And most recently, we've added a consulting service capability through the integration of another Hitachi company called Hitachi Consulting. 
And basically, you know, to sort of summarize, you know, we try and help companies to use their data to drive, you know, better customer experiences, improve their operational efficiency, and increase revenue. We have about 11,000 employees, as we show, and are headquartered in the Bay Area or in Santa Clara, California. Thank you. Next is uh, Mariko Misumi. She currently works in the cloud network, networking business at Cisco System in Japan, responsible for nationwide channel strategy and execution for tier one and tier two partners. Thank you, Grant. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Hi, my name is Marika Misumi. I'm a channel account manager at um, Cisco Meraki. Just a little bit um, of introduction about um, our company. Cisco Systems is a worldwide leader in IT networking and cybersecurity solutions. Um, we have over 77,000 employees across 480 locations and have roughly um, $50 billion dollars in revenue. Uh, my specific uh, job role is I am a channel account manager at Cisco Meraki. Meraki is a cloud networking division for Cisco, and it's actually one of the fastest growing um, acquisitions that they've had. We actually grew our business 20 times in the past um, seven years. Meraki's mission statement, as you can see right now, is to simplify technology to free passionate people to focus on their mission. So we provide simple IT that just works. Our solutions um, are very broad. We have Wi-Fi solutions, switching, security appliances, security cameras, but our mission is to have a really easy um, to use uh, networking product that you can um, easily deploy and manage from our cloud using our dashboard so that you can focus on what you really want to do. Uh, with that, we have now 500,000 customers globally um, with 5.5 million devices um, managed every single day on, on, on the cloud. Um, on a personal note, I am a mother of a five-month-old who is half Japanese and half Texan, so I am really um, glad I'm here today and thank you um, for having me. Great. Next is uh, Takamitsu Ono, who is the Director of Customer Support Services in Japan for Syn Synchronous. It's a US-based company who offers software platforms and cloud messaging, IoT, and other digital content management tools under a software as a service model. Onosan's experience actually includes working in Fort Worth, Texas here with me at Tandy Radio Shack Corporation uh, headquarters way back in the early 90s. So we go back uh, a long ways. Uh, so Onosan and Misumi-san are both working in Tokyo. So I appreciate them work, uh, waking up early to join us today. Onosan. Yeah, thank you, Grant. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to everybody. I'm so pleased to be here today uh, for the one of the events at the Japan America Society, Dallas Fort Worth, as I used to believe uh, in Fort Worth a long time ago, as Grant mentioned. So Synchronous, uh, we are providing software-based platform that help our customers deliver uh, customer interaction experience and uh, high value engagement uh, with their end customers and subscribers. Uh, we provide as a white label uh, to our customers. So I don't think that many or most of people don't know our company or even have heard, heard about uh, the company name. The solution we deliver is our cloud messaging and others as you see uh, on the slide deck. And our customers include major mobile carriers and large ISPs and cable TV operators across the globe, like AT&T, Verizon, BT, Amazon, though uh, most of the customers, we cannot uh, disclose uh, their names. So uh, thank you, Real, thank, uh, really thank you for inviting me uh, for this event today. Okay, last but not least, we are also privileged to have uh, Tsuyoshi Ueshima-san, Senior Vice President of Development, Fujitsu Network Communication, right here in Richardson in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. 
Ueshima san serves as the deputy head of the Global Photonics System Business Unit. Fujitsu is the number one IT service provider in Japan a, and a global leader in information and communication technology. Recently, I found out that Ueshima san has a connection with me and Ono san actually, uh, since one of his uh, high school classmates, a gentleman named Mr. Miyata, uh, happens to work with Ono san and I back uh, in the Tandy Corporation days uh, when we all worked in uh, Fort Worth. It's a small world. Ueshima san? Yes. Um, thank you very much, Ogata san. Um, and then uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm so glad to be here. Uh, and uh, good morning and uh, good evening, uh, people in Japan and US and, and the world. Uh, let me briefly talk about uh, uh, my company, uh, Fujitsu Network Communications. Uh, it's a company provides uh, digital transformation uh, expertise and uh, innovative uh, uh, value add solution for our communication network. Our headquarter is uh, right here in Richardson, Texas, which is a bit north of the uh, Dallas. And then uh, we have an organization of uh, engineering, manufacturing, uh, planning, and uh, uh, sales and marketing and also a service organization. Uh, little over 1,000 employees, uh, we develop a, and manufacture network product and software uh, for global market as well as uh, US market. And then uh, we also provide the various uh, 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 service for our communication networks. Our vision is a open architecture based technology integrator um, so in simple term, our job is connecting peoples and connecting uh, businesses for a better society. Thank you. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, now for the questions for the panelists. The first question is, how can your industry play a role in providing service and helping people and companies to connect during this time? How can technology help companies conduct business and meet safe human interaction needs with restrictions placed on social distance and travel? Let me, let's start with uh, Ueshima-san. Thank you very much for the great question. Um, so the industry uh, we are in, um, actually uh, network communication industry uh, must carry out well uh, what the things we always do. So, and then uh, maximize the uh, uh, use of the uh, foundation and infrastructure we already have. Um, obviously uh, COVID-19 um, uh, has brought a new challenges such as a uh, supply chain uh, uh, disruption or equipment installation uh, became very difficult. So uh, we must uh, um, uh, deal those challenges by uh, working together uh, with our um, suppliers and partners and also customers uh, by sharing uh, information and then uh, collaborate uh, solutions with um, Flexibility and then uh, innovations. I, I think those flexibility and innovation is very important uh, because uh, um, people uh, working uh, condition, the working pattern has changed. Uh, so uh, we can apply um, uh, some technologies to make uh, existing uh, uh, infrastructure of network uh, more flexible. Uh, there's a couple of technologies I can um, I can uh, identify. One is called the uh, uh, SDN. It's a software defined network, and then uh, uh, also um, uh, network automations uh, or virtualized uh, network functions. So those are many software based technology, but they uh, pro provide a high degree of uh, uh, flexibility uh, to the existing uh, infra infrastructure we have. 
So uh, it will allow the network operator to um, uh, reconfigure uh, existing equipment like uh, uh, fiber optics, uh, transponders, uh, optical switch, or packet switches uh, very quickly and then very easily so that the uh, um, network operator can uh, adapt the new traffic uh, demand or pattern. So as you know, many people start working from home or maybe some other place and then, or maybe start uh, using a video conference as we are uh, actually doing right this moment. So um, that actually causing uh, the traffic uh, a pattern change and then those uh, new technology uh, like SDN or uh, network automations actually can quickly adapt uh, those the, uh, those new demand. Also, it is very important to have a, a security uh, of the network and then uh, uh, cyber protection so that uh, data is always to delivered to the right person and then uh, there's no, um, uh, people uh, do not have to worry about uh, uh, any uh, um, uh, your important uh, company or business information is extracted by uh, wrong persons. So I think those are the, um, the prey we can, uh, the role we can play and then uh, 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 we should be, uh, we should be able to do that. Thank you, Ueshima-san. Um, Misumi-san, do you wanna chime in on this question? Yeah, um, I think this is a perfect question for um, Meraki because we at Meraki play an important role in helping people and companies connect and stay connected during this time. Uh, as a cloud managed networking vendor, we allow IT professionals to install and manage networking gears remotely, even from home. So what Ueshima-san just said, um, at software defined networking, uh, we can change our switches and our Wi-Fi settings uh, from home for the entire network globally. So, um, as an example, uh, one of our customers was able to build a remote worker solution in just two days, including shipping 250 gears to everyone's home, setting it up, and um, using site-to-site -site VPN um, and corporate Wi-Fi available at everyone's home. So when you are working at home with your kids watching Netflix um, and playing games, and you need to make sure that your Zoom video or um, audio conferencing or whatever that you're using has um, priority, you, you can um, easily adjust that using Meraki. So um, that's what we provide. And I think that is um, very, very um, pivotal in the current situation. Um, as for Meraki Japan um, itself, we've been able to work from home um, and still achieve double digit growth in our fiscal quarter ending in April. Um, by using our own technologies. And we use technologies like client VPN, um, WebEx conferencing, and WebEx Teams, which is our chat tool. So we have been able to um, continue our business day-to-day um, -day lives uh, without leaving the house. So that's some of the things that we can provide to the customers as a solution. Thank you, Mr. Misan. Blair, doesn't your company have some interesting tool uh, yeah, we do. We actually have several. I'll talk about one in particular. I mean, we have some virtual desktop solutions, you know, think Hyperconverge, which we do with VMware. We've got uh, uh, manufacturing solutions, which, uh, which provide insights. But the one that I'd like to talk about are something more uh, mundane, which are like thermal cameras. And that's part of our visualization suite. And what it does is if you're lining up in a bank, you're going to a grocery store, you're lining up at a checker, you're going to, you know, offices and lobbies where people are concerned about, you know, somebody going to be sick or somebody's got a temperature or a fever. What this does is we set up uh, some belt stanchions. Think of, you know, approaching a teller in a bank. And we've got thermal cameras set up. And they're set up at a preset threshold, right? So they can detect. So say your setting is at 100 degrees. And what that does is it'll tell you, okay, you've set this up, people are lining up, they go through sort of a screening station, if you will, and all that is is you've got a backdrop or a screen on the side, and as they're going through, the camera will ping you if you're over the set threshold. And so what ends up happening is, you know, you can then identify the person and say, okay, I think, you know, this is something we just need to discuss or put them, you know, ask them to step aside. But this is just one option that we have. We also have LIDAR, right? So now you've got social distancing concerns because people are standing close to each other. You know, you want to keep your 
six foot separation, you want to keep one meter separation. Once again, set up a threshold, you know, and then you're good to go. The, you know, the couple of advantages that we have is one, it's non-invasive, right? So think about, you know, some of those ugly guts that people have held to their heads for temperature sensing. You know, when you're doing temperature scanning, this is completely non-invasive. It's easy to set up and you can set your thresholds because remember different parts of the world have different social distancing requirements. They have different GDPR requirements, global data privacy requirements. So we've gone through that and this product has been getting a lot of traction because obviously our aim is one employee safety is our number one concern. Customer safety is our number one concern. And we wanna make sure that you know, we're contributing to the society in a meaningful way. And I think the Hitachi visualization suite is one that um, I'm happy to talk about. So, and we're gonna set this up in our headquarters in Santa Clara as soon as you know, the shelter in place is lifted. So I'll be happy to display it. So if anybody's ever interested, I'd be more than happy to show them on this. Thanks. Thank you, Blair. Wow, that was a lot of technology. I, I hope uh, uh, some of you understood. Uh, but uh, next question is actually uh, less technical and it involves a uh, situation in Japan. In Japan, business and uh, collaborations are conducted conducted usually face to face. Uh, what is the difference between Japan and US in terms of remote work situation? What are both the advantages and limitations involved in using remote video conference technologies rather than face to face interactions? Will business customs change as a result? Ono-san, you wanna chime in on this one? Yeah, thank you. Well, this is an uh, interesting uh, question, a uh, more culture thing, I think. So as maybe a geographic reason where uh, many of large companies, offices, and their headquarters are concentrated in Tokyo or some in Osaka area in Japan. So it, it is very easy to have face-to-face -face opportunities without having any long trip unlike other regions like North America or, or Europe. And since uh, we are kind of accustomed with face-to-face -face for a business environment for a long time, and uh, many people, especially like executive and management level people might still believe face-to-face uh, -face, uh, brings better results or kind of must to have. So to be honest, uh, at this point, I'm really not sure how this custom will change even after this uh, pre unprecedented situation was over. Uh, so talking about uh, the technology, about the uh, video conference uh, thing, although this is a little bit different aspect, but while doing uh, remote video, conference from home, especially with customer. One thing I notice is we cannot do whispering between colleagues on things we don't, do not want the customer to hear. If we only, you know, uh, colleagues in together in the meeting room, we can just uh, mute uh, the Zoom or WebEx. Uh, or if we are in, the, in a meeting room with the customer, uh, we just, you know, excuse and go out the room to talk. But uh, right now we cannot do that. Uh, I don't think uh, we have such technology uh, with the WebEx or Zoom. Uh, so of course, uh, uh, separate uh, group chat like a Teams or Slack or Skype can be used uh, for this kind of purpose. But some people still do not like to use chat or you know, like a slow in typing. So if a system uh, can have a function like to create a virtual room inside the main room uh, to do a whispering uh, with the specific people, uh, that may be interesting and that may sell. That's, that's one thing I really uh, think recently about technology, about the video conferencing. Thank you. Oh, very interesting. That's an interesting idea. You should patent that. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Blair, do you have any uh, thoughts on this? You have some uh, experience uh, yeah. seeing workplace in Japan. Yeah, it is. It's interesting because, you know, the average size of a, uh, an office in the U.S. compared to Japan is obviously, you know, the offices, in, especially in Tokyo, are a lot more concentrated. Space is more expensive. On an average, U.S. employee gets about 200 square foot per head when you're designing space. In Japan, the metrics are almost half of that because the cube size are smaller, there's fewer offices there. So obviously the, that causes and poses different challenges. I think one of the things we've seen is, as, as part of my business continuity responsibility is, the lack of social interactions right now is a challenge, right? How are people going to address that? And an interesting study came out from Stanford very recently is that people are doing a lot of multitasking when they're on these calls and therefore they're having a hard time recollecting things as opposed to people who are single focused, right? So if I'm talking on this and I'm doing other things, I'm trying to answer emails and doing other things. So that's an interesting observation because I think there is always that fear that, you know, as Onosan mentioned, what are people doing? I mean, can you whisper to other people? Can you do other things versus, you know, avoiding multitasking? And another observation that was made was, you know, watching multiple people with different backgrounds sort of increase your stimulation, right? So that makes it difficult for people to sort of, um, the motivation it gives you and the feed that it gives you is harder to sort of step away from. So you're exhausted more as opposed to just being on the phone or you're talking in email, right? So those are some interesting observations. And, you know, there's a couple of other things in remote technologies that I'll talk about perhaps later, but just those are a couple of things that come to mind. Are we at an inflection point? You know, it's hard to tell, like Onosan said, I just don't know. I think we're too, it's too early in this process to know if this is an inflection point and our habits are gonna change or if there's going to be some new technology that's gonna come out where you know people are gonna stop going to the office or they're gonna reduce their attendance, right? I think the jury's still out on that, though I'm, uh, there is a lot of push to try and get people to work from home. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. Next, um, you know, we hear companies and families using video conference tools such as Zoom, like we're using WebEx, uh, Microsoft Team. Uh, what are some of the advantages and limitations of these? We touched on, Onosan touched on it a little bit. Uh, Misumi-san, I know you work for Cisco. Uh, please don't try to uh, badmouth uh, Zoom and Teams uh, just because you have WebEx uh, as part, part of your uh, portfolio. I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one thing that I've um, been finding out is that since um, Japan declared the state of emergency in April, um, I have family and friends working for Japanese companies or business partners in remote cities who have never used video conferencing before, who hesitated to even install WebEx for us using MS Teams, Zoom, or WebEx on a daily basis. Um, the biggest advantage, obviously, compared to um, not having video conferencing is that you can see their facial expression, and I use a lot of, you know, hand gestures, so you can actually understand the nuances and the context better than emails um, or chats. Um, and also, if you live alone, um, I think um, uh, Blair mentioned, mentioned a little bit, but um, you actually feel connected um, by seeing your coworkers or your customers' face, so um, that really is the advantage of video conferencing. Um, with you know companies and families. Um, uh, if there's disadvantages, I would point out two disadvantages. One is bandwidth and the other one is security. With bandwidth, uh, in, in Japan, many people live in apartments and the internet connection is one line coming into the apartment, which is shared by all the tenants with internet contract. So especially during the day, like I said before, if you have um, family members watching Netflix or if there's 50 tenants living in one apartment complex, all using internet. It's really hard to um, prioritize and have good connectivity. So when you try to have a video call in the middle of the day, you can have your video drop off or your voice doesn't go through. So that is one restriction uh, that we have. 
The other issue is security. Japan's information security protection is very strict. So many companies either allow video conferencing uh, in, for internal use only, or you can have video conferencing with customers, but you cannot show or share content. So instead of collaborating, um, sharing content on your screen and collaborating and talking about what you want to present, you actually have to email them the content beforehand and be like, hey, did you get my email? Can you open it? Oh, what's, what's the password? Oh, the password is this. You have all these struggles to go through and you don't even know if the person is actually reading what you're presenting right now. So uh, this seems to be, uh, especially for Japanese companies, especially in finance, um, a major issue that they have when it comes to productivity because although you can see the customer's face, you're not quite sure if you are actually collaborating and like Blair said, if the customer is actually focused on what we are trying to present. So um, those are the uh, advantages that I can think of. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Misan. Uh, we're running a little behind, so I'm gonna skip to the next question. Uh, Using some IT tools, what are some interesting new businesses or customs being developed these days to over, overcoming people working at home, having restricted mobility, and being separate from their family, friends, relatives, and of course their customers? Uh, Ono-san, you want to answer this one? Yeah, this is, uh, again, this is kind of culture thing I want to talk about. So one issue we have in Japan is hanko. Uh, that's a personal seal or company seal that uh, still officially required at many places like application paperwork at the government or city office or you know at the bank or in a company process paperwork. So it is very true that there are still many people today who have to go to office just to stamp seal to do the paperwork for example, like for request for paid time of vacation, they still have to go to the office just just to stamp the uh, hanko. So, uh, but uh, the solutions for like electronic signature are already there uh, in the market. So, it is just a matter of how company or government can change and adjust their system and the regulations. Uh, so it is uh, one of the challenges uh, we have uh, in Japan uh, right now that I, I, I think of. Thank you. Interesting, thank you, Ono-san. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip one question and go to the next question, which is one of the technologies being developed is contact tracing by tracking people who have been exposed to COVID-19 using their smartphones. What are your thoughts about use of such technology and balancing privacy concerns? Blair? So um, at this point, you know, Hitachi does not use this kind of technology. We don't condone it. Um, but speaking uh, to my colleagues and some of the other countries, um, you know, that technology has been used successfully. You know, one country that comes to mind is South Korea, where uh, they've done a wonderful job controlling the spread of the virus. And I think that's something that we should uh, be aware of. The other issue is obviously GDPR, so global data privacy issues, right? We have to be cognizant of that. We want to make sure that those are addressed in such situations. Um, I think with the advent of smartphone technology, I think this will become some, an issue that people are going to have to deal with over time. Uh, per, you know, one of the ways that can be addressed is whether people want to have an opt-in or opt-out approach. That's one option. But I just want to make it clear, I don't know, from a Hitachi standpoint, we do not do this. Um, and, uh, you know, this is not something that we're planning to do. But I think this is something that needs to be looked at in the very near future, because I think a lot of countries are going to be implementing this. Thank you, Blair. I heard of uh, companies developing a, a solution for, for their uh, corporate campus tracking their employees and this uh, information, it doesn't go outside of the building, it's strictly internal. So uh, 
have you, have you heard, has, any, has anybody heard of that kind of solution uh, to track people and trace people, making sure their uh, uh, social distance is properly practiced, uh, et cetera? Has anybody heard of that? Uh, maybe I can, I can pitch in. Um, <clears throat> it, it's actually still the proof of concept stage, but the uh, combination of the video stream networking and then some uh, video analytic uh, uh, technology, uh, we recently did the demo demonstration of uh, uh, analyzing the video data at the uh, uh, remote locations. Um, then uh, uh, detecting uh, people follow the uh, social distance, maybe at the uh, lobby of the building or entrance of the bu building. And then uh, uh, in this uh, particular application, what people can do is maybe this uh, 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 analyzed uh, data uh, result can be allowed the uh, building managers and then they can uh, take appropriate actions if the people do not follow the uh, um, uh, social distancing. So uh, I think those technologies, probably uh, more of those, but uh, becoming uh, available, the existing technology can allow us to, uh, to do that. Yeah. Thank you, Eshma san Interesting. OK, we'll go on to the next question. Uh, in your opinion, what other future IT technologies do you think will help link people and help companies conduct business as usual. Uh, Ueshima san. Okay, I, I think probably I would, uh, I would say 5G and then IoT, uh, Internet of Things. Actually, uh, uh, 5G is happening uh, uh, before the uh, pandemic and IoT is also happening before the pandemic, but those technologies uh, 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 probably can provide a lot of values and solutions uh, to the uh, uh, this type of situation when the mobility of the people are, are restricted. Uh, I just want to touch base a little bit about uh, what um, especially a uh, 5G technology can provide. Um, um, so compared to the uh, uh, previous uh, wireless technology, it's also it's provide the uh, 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 more bandwidth uh, to the uh, um, user equipment uh, to the uh, uh, the phone, uh, uh, you know, higher speed uh, speed of the uh, data. But uh, not only that, uh, the 5G can provide, uh, it's called the uh, low latency, which is the meaning uh, the data packet uh, traveling time from uh, uh, user's equipment to uh, radio towers to uh, maybe uh, edge computer location, uh, very small amount of the propagation delay uh, the, the 5G can provide. And then uh, um, I, um, also the 5G can provide the, uh, a massive number of uh, user, um, uh, user equipment. Um, so those are the, under the assumption, the uh, low latency is uh, because uh, uh, we want to use uh, new wireless technology, not just for the human communication, but also um, maybe uh, self-driving cars or self-driving drones. And uh, in order to control uh, uh, those, uh, those uh, device or those uh, target, you have to have very uh, short amount of the communication delays so that uh, low latency can help. And then a uh, massive amount of the uh, uh, number of device supporting is, so previous uh, wireless technologies is assumption of the human is the main user of the wireless device. But uh, as uh, IoT um, uh, uh, coming uh, became available, uh, not just a human, but also things uh, going to have a device uh, so that the wireless infrastructure can support uh, those uh, huge number of, uh, of uh, uh, end user equipment and uh, so make it uh, um, um, uh, application possible. So I think the Actual application development is still underway, but um, like uh, automated uh, delivery service or some sort of uh, uh, traffic control, uh, those are uh, um, uh, traffic control of the car or traffic control of the human uh, can be automated uh, with using uh, 5G and IoT technologies. Thank you, Esma san uh, Misumi-san, what other, what other future IT technologies do you think uh, will help 
link people and help companies conduct business? Um, yep. So uh, let me talk about uh, things that I think will help businesses focusing in Japan. Uh, Japan is still very face-to-face -face and paper-centric. So technologies like process automation or uh, enhanced contact centers where you can use multimedia to serve customers or tools uh, while more and more uh, applications move to the cloud, visualizing and managing, optimizing SaaS applications effect effectively would be some of the future tech IT technologies that will help companies and conduct the business as usual. However, uh, this may be a surprise to many Americans joining the event today, but in Japan, companies still rely on fax machines and individuals, employees do not even have dial-in numbers. So even under quarantine, we had people who has to go to the office to pick up the phone or PDF the faxes or the invoices that, get, that they receive by mail. So although future technology is very important, I think current technologies like PBX that can uh, that has a smartphone application so you can take the switchboard number at home or uh, fax to email. Simple things like that can actually help companies conduct business as usual without risking people's lives. And also many companies still provide desktop computers work to workers. So even if companies provide client VPN, employees do not have a medium to bring back home to conduct work unless you want to carry the desktop computer home. So virtual tech desktops or simply providing a laptop could actually help many SMB businesses in Japan. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Misan. Okay, let's go on to our last question. Um, how do you think this uh, COVID-19 experience will change our everyday life? How do you think new technologies will be used to create the so-called new normal? Uh, Blair, you want to take this on? Uh, sure. You know, the most, if we think about companies or events that are being impacted the most, think of all these kickoff sales meetings, Las Vegas, right? Where you go in, you've got these huge sales kickoffs, you've got, you know, um, open world. All of that is now changing dramatically, you know? So, and one of the things that I think um, that Oshima-san mentioned about IoT, I think that's a great opportunity. I think use of sensors is going to increase dramatically. I think with the, well, some of the surveys that we've conducted have indicated now that people are very willing to do a combination of work from home and coming into the office. So mobile apps, smartphones, I think those are areas that we'll see a lot of changes coming into. And, you know, for the first time, now Hitachi Limited in Japan is actually is giving employees an allowance to purchase uh, PPEs, to buy masks, to buy gloves. And there is now movement for people to work from home as well as in the office. I think these are things that will be happening in the near future. I mean, there are going to be challenges like, you know, ergonomic issues at home. How do people, you know, whether they have the proper uh, space to work from home. And because it's a global issue, I think some of the solutions will have to be regionalized. But I think, you know, yes, I, I think there will be impacts that will, uh, you know, change some of the things that we do on a regular basis. The question is, like I mentioned before, is this an inflection point or is this just an evolution? And I think the jury's out on that. I think we'll probably find that out in the next year or two, how that's going to be, um, how that's going to impact us. And the other thing, obviously, is bandwidth. You know, now we've suddenly got all these people coming in from home. Do we have that in different parts of the world? How is that going to impact our daily lives? And I think there's a lot of push to improve infrastructure, especially in some of the uh, countries that historically have not had, you know, a tremendous amount of success uh, for employees working from home. I think that's another area that will be impacted. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. That was, uh, that concludes uh, basic questions that I had. Now I want to turn to the audience uh, and uh, answer some questions that you might have from the audience. Uh, Paul, do we have any questions uh, from the audience? Yes, if you look in your chat function. Okay, okay, here, here we go. <laughs> well, we have a lot, okay. Okay, uh, ooh, 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 sorry. Uh, this, uh, Sorry, I'm taking a while to 
get through the comments I'm receiving before I get to the questions. Uh, there's some questions from the audience, Ono-san, that, that Zoom has a private chat function that you can use. Uh, Thank you uh, very much. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, What kind of employee engagements are Japanese company doing in Japan? Uh, anybody want to answer that? I think I can just take a quick uh, uh, stab at it and then maybe the others. Um, as I mentioned, Itachi is doing a lot for this, right? So we're now reimbursing or giving people money to go out and buy um, equipment for their own safety, so masks and gloves on a monthly basis. The second thing obviously we're looking at is how can we help them work from home more? I think there is a paradigm shift in that sense because we are trying to figure out, you know, if we have more employees in Japan working from home, how will that impact the infrastructure? How will that impact employee habits? So I think uh, we are definitely uh, looking at that and we're certainly making some headway because we have allowed more and more employees uh, will start to work from home uh, in Japan for Hitachi. Okay, thank you. We have a question uh, for... Uh, sorry. I just wanted to add... Um, go so, ahead. At, uh, so at Cisco in Japan, uh, not Japanese company, but uh, at Cisco we have online yoga days, online stretch days, um, online sweets days, uh, lunch days where you bring your lunch and actually talk with colleagues that are in a different department um, or mindfulness day where you know you talk about mindfulness and breathing in and stuff like that so those are some of the things that we provide uh, and I think we have at least one event going on uh, every week so that's how we try to engage employees and uh, make sure that uh, people are not feeling alone okay great well, we got you uh, online. There's a question from Jack Mormon for Ms. Misan uh, asking uh, for bandwidth in the US, we can use our phone as a hotspot tethering uh, directly to internet access. Uh, or, so internet access like this directly, is it available in Japan as well? This hot, yep. personal hotspot? Yeah. So I actually have my hotspot available as well. So yes, you can definitely tether. Uh, a lot of the companies uh, do not provide cell phones to uh, back office people in Japan. So whether you have a corporate phone or not would be one question. Uh, we also have a lot of corporate phones that are still feature phones, not smartphones. In that case, you cannot tether. So you and so it depends on a does the company provide a phone for you. B, is it a smartphone? Uh, C, what the data plan is like, because my data plan, for instance, is seven gig. So if you are on Zoom every single day, that's not enough to tether. So all things considered, yes, we do have an option. Not everyone might be able to have access to it. How, how popular or prevalent is the unlimited data plan in Japan? I, a unlimited data plan I think um, if you are a consumer and you have a private contract, like right now I have like 30 gigs, but I think corporate, we still pull uh, gigs for everyone. And I know for sure that my corporate plan is seven gigs. So it's, it's getting there, but not quite unlimited for everyone yet. Okay. Let's go on to the next question. Uh, someone is asking, which, in our opinion, which culture, American or Japanese, will adopt better to continue remote working and which will feel more pressure to have employees come back to the office? I think I know the answer, but uh, who, who wants to take this on? Ono-san or Ueshima-san, you want to take this one? Maybe I can, let me try. So um, since I'm, I've been working from US for many years, I think this is seven years. So I probably um, have, uh, I should say a lack of perspective from Japan. Uh, but uh, um, 
I think from my uh, you know point of view, probably U.S. side is more uh, relatively easy to adapt to this type of environment. Actually, probably this may, I'm not sure this is common to Japan, but the U.S. many company, include my company and other companies saying, actually working from home in a certain uh, industry, the productivity actually went up. Actually, I, I can see, at least my organization, um, believe it or not, the productivity is probably slightly higher than uh, before. It's maybe, you know, we don't have a commuting time anymore, and then I think uh, I also read the article that saying, you know, people tend to work uh, more and maybe uh, skip lunch or maybe uh, stay uh, late. So, um, but uh, my impression is the U.S. is uh, e uh, uh, easy to adapt, but I, I really like to hear the people who work in Japan and how they feel about this question. Yeah, I agree that U.S. is uh, it's easier to adapt. Uh, but in Japan, I think it's, it's not going to be uh, any rapid or drastic change, but w I think we'll start accepting changes uh, gradually in the near future. Uh, recently, uh, I see uh, this, several surveys around this uh, new normal thing. And I believe that uh, in average, uh, more, than f more than 50 to 60% of people say that they want to continue remote work or think they think that uh, the, their work can be done without being at an office. So uh, but also on the other hand, there are still so many people who want to be remote but are required by company to be at an office. So I think in future, uh, if the company was not flexible enough for way of work or work style, uh, good or competent resources may go away so if a company uh, want or maintain such good resources, I think they, they have to change. They have to start changing uh, the way of thinking. Yeah, that's my I thought. Agree. Yeah, I agree. There's a, another question that's related to that topic we just talked about. Uh, this person is asking what, what percentage of workforce do you expect to continue to work from home after the pandemic is over? Any differences between U.S. and Japan? Any any opinions on that? I don't know. What, what percentage do the people in the U.S. is working remotely before the pandemic? I think a lot more than Japan. I would say for Japan, maybe more than 90% they go to office. Well, I don't know about US, maybe yeah. a lot more. So let, let me ask you, if it's 90% today, uh, before pandemic, what do you think will be the percentage after? Is it 90% back to 90% business as usual? Uh, I don't think so, but still, as I said, it will. it's not rapid change, but I think it's going to be like, a, 70%, 60%, eventually may go 50%, but I'm really not sure because of a culture thing, a lot of the culture thing in Japan may restrict, you know, from doing that, you know, thing in at the, the business environment. Mm -hmm. Misumi-san, do you have any opinion? Um, I personally think that I agree with Onosan and maybe 60 to 70 percent of the company oh sorry maybe 60 70 percent of companies might implement an option to work from home but whether it would be a regular thing to have remote workers completely i think it'll still take time blair what about the us what do you think I think it depends on the industry. Uh, I think the certain industries obviously are not going to be able to change anytime soon and they need like manufacturing, for example, right? People need to come in. For uh, technology companies, I think there is definitely going to be an increased shift. You know, Facebook just recently uh, mentioned that they're going to decentralize some of their hiring practices. So they're now going to be able to hire people who can work from home as opposed to developers or software engineers coming into the office regularly. 
So I think it's hard to, uh, like I said, uh, project a percentage right now, but based on the industries that are encouraging people to work from home, I think there will be a push to continue that. I think uh, there will certainly be savings from a real estate standpoint. The question is how will that impact the everyday employee? Because I mean, there are employees who are absolutely right. We're going to be we're working longer hours. We're you know putting in more because there's really no boundaries between you know work from home. So when do you log off? I think those are still challenges that need to be worked out. I agree. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to another question we have. Um, with all the people going online, uh, gobbling up uh, bandwidth, uh, how much stress has it put on the overall network capacity and how much more can we handle uh, what, what's being done to increase the network capacity? Uh, where's my son or uh, anybody? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, we are getting uh, uh, actually a, a report from our customers uh, who are providing uh, the uh, network connectivity, and then uh, uh, almost all major company uh, obviously saying in the order of uh, fifty percent to eighty percent increase uh, of the demand. Uh, but amazingly, uh, we are. We are holding up uh, still fairly well. I don't think I have heard uh, because of the uh, uh, the capacity. Capacity is the reason the uh, uh, you know network uh, start uh, uh, connection became problem. Uh, we also seen the demand increase. Um, so uh, so people, I think uh, our customers, network operator is predicting uh, this situation uh, will last for a while. Um, I guess the, it's related to previous question. This is going to be new norm, or how many people actually return to the office, and then, you know, the uh, total demand, uh, how much is uh, it's, uh, it's uh, decline. But uh, in in terms of the original question, yes, bandwidth uh, demand has been increased in the order of fairly substantial amount, fifty percent to eighty percent. But uh, uh, most of the uh, network operator actually holding it fairly well. Thank you, Wesmasan. One other question I have, uh, it's a challenge for Japanese workers is uh, working from home where the houses are tend to be very small. So Ono-san, you wanna share some thoughts on that? What's the difference in Japan versus the US? It's it's a big difference. Uh, uh, usually, uh, we have only small uh, apartment housing, and in fact, I don't have my own room. So this is this is well, my background is Shibuya, but uh, this is just a corner of living room. So uh, I have three kids, and uh, they're you know running around all the time during I'm doing some Zoom conference with the customers. So. That, that, that's another challenge, uh, you know, unique challenge in Japan. Uh, but myself, I don't have any solution unless I move a house or uh, create some small booths in, in my apartment. Uh, but yes, that's, that's a challenge in Japan. That's true. Yeah, yeah. It's a big problem. Uh, Paul, uh, I, I know we're running out of time now. Do you want to? We have any last minute comments? Uh, on sure. behalf of uh, what, let me just thank the panelists for joining us and thank the audience for joining uh, from around the clock, around the world, I mean. Uh, Paul, go ahead. Sure. Um, so thank you so much, Grant. I know we had a few more questions in the queue, but um, we can share those with the panelists and hopefully they can give us some more feedback. Um, so again, uh, thank you, Grant, for your exemplary moderating of today's program. And thank you to all our panelists for their insights on technology companies in Japan and the United States during COVID-19. We, we greatly appreciate your time and willingness to share. We would also like to express our gratitude to everyone who attended the program and for your eagerness to explore the US-Japan relationship. 
we kindly ask that you complete the post event survey, which will pop up when the program is completed. If you are unable to view this or access this survey, we will share it again through email tomorrow. If you enjoy programming like this, we ask that you consider making a donation to the Japan America Society of Dallas Fort Worth. Information on how to give will be in the chat box in just a few moments, but we also include on tomorrow's email. I invite everyone to join us for our next program coming up on the screen in just a moment. There we go. On gaming, online entertainment, and the Cool Japan Initiative during COVID-19. This program will take place on Wednesday, June 10th, again on Zoom, and that will be at 5 p.m. Dallas time. So again, as you can see on the screen, uh, June 10th at 5 p.m. Please check our website, www.jasdfw.org, for regular updates as we schedule more programs throughout the summer and into the fall. This concludes tonight's program. Thank you for attending and have a wonderful rest of your evening or morning.